All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Dr. Michael Barbera, who is in North Carolina. How are you doing, Michael? I'm also, I am calm. <laughs> I'm calm, I love that, yeah. This is, our, this is a new one we're going to adopt when anybody asks us how we are. We're just gonna say that we're calm, I love it. Um, Dr. Dr. Michael is Chief Behavioral Officer at Clicksuasion Labs, an award-winning consumer psychologist, business strategist, and has Fortune 500 clients, including um, many, he includes many of his clients among the Fortune 500. And he's appeared on ABC Shark Tank, Bravo's Million Dollar Listing, Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares. And guess what? He's still here after he survived Gordon Ramsay, and that's always... Uh, you got to give somebody kudos for that. And today we're going to talk about consumer psychology and sales and marketing alignment. Hey, listen, um, Michael, whenever sales and marketing alignment ever comes up, right? I have to say this, and regardless of whether it comes up, whether it came up in 2015 or 2020, I would say is like, here we are in 2020. Why are we still talking about sales and marketing alignment? How come we haven't cracked that nut yet? <laughs> They're, they're one item because uh, we, over, we overlook what the customer is buying. We like to think, mm -hmm. well, we are marketing X and we are selling Y, but are you really? So uh, at the end of the day, the customer is not buying X or Y. They're buying confidence. They're buying convenience. They're buying sexy. They're buying whatever makes them feel good. And calm, hopefully. Calm, yes. Calm. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, and and yes, and yet we we tend to often look at things too much from an internal perspective, from a departmental perspective, from what our what our specific job is. And as you say, I mean, I don't think we spend a lot of time on on looking at the consumer or consumer psychology, which you're an expert in. And yet, regardless of whether we're in sales and marketing, we're also consumers. But we seem to it's, we seem to do this amazing thing is that when we step through the door, maybe it's a virtual door today, of work, we forget all about that and we become sales and marketing people. I think it's kind of reverse. When I go shopping, sometimes I forget the field that I work in and I'm like, ooh, Bed Bath & Beyond, that was really good. You <laughs> almost got me. That's, I'm going to write that down. That's clever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then, so let's talk a bit about uh, consumer psychology. Uh, can you explain it maybe just as a baseline for people um, when you talk about consumer psychology, what are you talking about? Good question. It is the, the study of decisions, the study of choices. How do we choose one item over an alternative? When we go to Best Buy, how do we choose the 60 inch over the 58 inch? How do we choose the gas station on the left side of the road that has two cents higher fuel and the gas station on the right that has two cents lower fuel? What is our choices? Why do we make those? And how can we reduce the barriers between brand and making those choices? Yeah, and it's and, and fascinating because the, the idea of choice, uh kind of really fascinates me because I think kind of as people we're kind of we struggle with choice we're almost hardwired we don't want to make choices because if we choose one thing it is we by default unchoose something else and we want to have keep all our options open so when you when you study consumer behavior what does make what are the things that make somebody choose one over another like why does somebody choose the one gas station on the right as opposed to one on the left and why would they choose the higher priced one over the lower priced one? So good questions. I probably have two separate answers because there's sure. so many variables that go into consumer decision making. Oh. Mm -hmm. So let's use, let's use the gas station and customer experience with, uh, with for the first answer. Let's mm -hmm. say you're driving to work and you're driving down X highway and this gas station says 99 cents per gallon. What are you going to do? You know, pull right in, right? You can, you exactly. can have, eight tenths of a, of a tank full of fuel, you're probably still gonna fill up that last remaining bit because the fuel is so inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Now you're excited, you're happy, you put that pump into your vehicle, you finish pumping, you hang it up, and that little screen on the pump says, see cashier first. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, the anxiety is real. Yeah. And so yeah. with that cashier is 40 feet that way, but we are too lazy to walk there. And so mm -hmm. now we were so excited over the price, we were devastated over having to walk 40 feet and that we had these emotions of positivity and negative emotions all before we ever used the product. Mm. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that is, that is really interesting because, and then 
I mean, with human psychology being what it is, we tend then to probably walk away with, yeah, we're happy that we got the cheap gas, but we're probably more kind of upset about the walk um, and the fact that that wasn't working. And if somebody asked us later, we'd say, yeah, the gas is cheap, but you know, uh, their systems are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but then, so it's not, and price isn't always the factor. So if we were to ask customers, what's most important to you? More than likely customers are going to self-report price, what, what the total mm -hmm. item costs. But that's not really true. So if I was saying, uh, John, imagine you're on a beach on a hot day. You want nothing more than your favorite brand of beer. Your friends can yeah. get up, go to the only place around it is a small rundown grocery store. They'll bring you back your favorite brand of beer as long as it costs as much or less than the price you're willing to pay. So small mm -hmm. rundown grocery store, only place around. The average person, now you can pay whatever you want to pay. Two bananas, four bananas, nine bananas. The average person is willing to pay $8 and change for that beer. Now let's take that same scenario and revise it just a little bit. Now the only place around is a fancy resort. The average person in this scenario is willing to pay $12 and change for that very same beer. The beer is more than likely brewed by the same facility, bottled mm -hmm. by the same company, shipped by the same truck, sold. The same. And John, you and I, we're consuming that beer on the beach so the environment doesn't change. Yet there's an economic value and a perceived value. More so if I was to say, John, that grocery store closes in 10 minutes. Now you're going to buy that beer for whatever price it's being sold for. Um, but if you get to this, let me that, if you get to the store minute one or minute nine, you'll get it for whatever price it's being sold for. But the scarcity only place around and time pressure, 10 minutes from right now, is so cognitively overwhelming that now the average person is willing to pay $15 and change for that same beer. Yeah, so I mean, it, 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 is, it is fascinating like how many variables come into play. So how can you, um, it, when you're in sales and marketing, like how can you help people either manage these variables or eliminate some of these variables? You know, that's a great question. I don't think I've been asked that question in a long time. I don't think it's possible to eliminate all the variables. You can reduce mm -hmm. how many variables are around. But the challenge is, though, is that we carry smartphones in our pocket. And so we're walking around stores like zombies like this, where most consumers are. And so now there's variables. The world's variables are, are um, available to our persuasion and influence. So we can try to reduce, but we can't really limit because they're always out there. Now, what we can do is we can control for certain things. So uh, message framing is a great way to control. Mm -hmm. Ikea does this great. If you go to Ikea, you park in the parking lot, you see this giant warehouse um, and you're primed to think, wow, Ikea, it's a warehouse. They should have everything I ever need. It should never be an issue whatsoever. Now, you don't say those words out loud, but cognitively, you've already processed mm -hmm. that. Now, you go on Ikea, you go through this maze and this journey of one-way traffic, no windows, no, uh, no doors or exits, no clocks. It's like a casino inside. Then you finally find that one desk that you really want, but it's no longer there. So most retailers would say, unavailable, out of stock, uh, order online, back ordered, uh, standard, standard messages. Yeah. But those messages blame the company. They blame the brand. Well, darn you, Ikea, I can't get my desk. So mm -hmm. what Ikea does is they control the message framing and remove that blame or that negative variable and they say, oversold. Now, what that does is you're placing blame on the other consumers. Like, darn you, this, this item is yeah. so popular that it's, I can't get it. So now the brand saves brand equity and you want it even more because of social proof. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's such a fascinating, like, um, just uh, with, as you say, with just the messaging, uh, the messaging change, how it, how it completely um, changes the attitude of the, of the consumer. Uh, and so, so when people are, are selling like, you know, B2B products or whatever, I mean, again, the, the messaging that you see from most people, it tends to sort of follow the same patterns. Um, so how can, how can companies break out of that and, and be more kind of, and be cleverer like Ikea? That's pretty good. So in B2B, we want to avoid selling. Whoa, Mike, what do you mean we're not going to sell? That's how our, that's how we make our revenue. Yes. Uh, in B2B, trust is a significant factor. So we can say trust applies to B2C as well, and it does. There's perceived trust. And in B2B, you have to build solid trust. Whereas in, in B2B, we prefer to work with someone who we know, like, and trust, more so than the subject matter expert. If the subject matter expert is a jerk, we're probably not going to work with that person and find the person who is 
well enough qualified, but a really nice person. It's, it's the, it goes to the question of not who would you hire, but who would you prefer to sit next to on a plane for five hours from New York to Los Angeles? So building trust, building that relationship, and building a relationship isn't saying, hey, how are you today? How's the weather? It's actually building a friendship. Put that, that buyer, that decision maker in the friend zone. Treat them as if there was somebody that you'd invite them to your home for dinner, and you have a, a, a higher chance of success to build trust and get closer to you know, potentially closing that deal. Because I think sometimes we underestimate the, uh, you know, how much emotion is tied up in a B2B purchase from the people who are responsible for that purchase. Because I always say to people, you know, in consumer buying, like if I go out and buy a 60 inch TV, you know, today, the biggest trouble I'm going to get into is my wife's probably going to hit me over the head with it for wasting money, right? But if I'm making a B2B buying decision, it can be career enhancing if it turns out to be a good one. It can be career limiting if it turns out to be a, a, poor, a poor choice. So I think sometimes as sellers in that, that we don't, we underestimate uh, that there's a lot of personal emotion and personal uh, stuff wrapped up in the sale as well as from the company. Absolutely. Uh, anytime there's a human involved, emotion comes into play. There is, n I, I do not like to speak in absolutes, but I'm going to now and I'm saying <laughs> there are, there's never a scenario when there's a human involved that emotion does not apply. There is no such thing as a completely objective decision. We can try to limit variables or reduce um, biases, but there'll always be a little bit of a bias somewhere hidden in there. So the way we engage and, and sometimes the difference between uh, closing a deal and not closing a deal could be a phrase that we said, something that we said that someone else was offended by and we'll never know. And so those little things go a significant long way and they have, they carry more weight in B2B than they do in B2C. Yeah. And the other thing I think that you see in, in B2B a lot is it, that often you don't lose the deal to a competitor. You lose the deal to no decision because at the end of the day, you haven't built enough trust right, that, that they feel like they can actually make that last step and, and purchase. They'll sort of go, mm, I'll probably just live with what I have. That, that seems. So how do you, how do you, when you're engaging, how do you help with that process? Because they always have that fallback position, unless it's absolutely mission critical, which unfortunately rarely is that mission critical, that they always have the option just to go, mm, I'll just wait, we'll just stick with what we have. I'm not sure I have the, the best possible answer to solve everyone's <laughs> challenge there, but I'll try to give some nuggets that we can, or best practices, and that is to um, uh, engage with the potential client in areas where are not traditional for you, or at least where your competitors are not. If you're emailing your potential client or client, you're probably doing it wrong because everyone else is emailing. So those who have decision-making authority are likely busy from eight till four, eight till seven, 60 hours a week. These people already have loaded inboxes and don't have time to respond to every sales message. And if you're trying to sell a sales message and, or push a product or service in an email, so will 40 other people on the same day. So what makes you stand out? Get away from email pick up the phone and call. Even if they don't answer you, you have to voicemail. It's a touch point in a different manner or method or channel than everyone else is currently using. If you write a handwritten note, that's also a touch point in a manner that other people are not doing. And the, um, the persuasiveness of the handwritten note is that if the person finds the message to be authentic, to be real, they are likely to keep it on their desk. And now every time they log into their computer, potentially with an eyesight is that handwritten note with your name on it. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's incredibly important now because I mean I do think it's harder and harder to stand out, and and differentiating yourself by doing things like handwritten notes I think is is absolutely something people should consider, um, and also I think there's I think there's another phenomenon at play now I think um, especially since you know the pandemic and all of that you know there's a lot of people who who are working at home or working more in isolation than they've ever been before. So there's a, when you talk about picking up the phone, I think there's a greater um, appetite for actually answering the phone and engaging and talking to people now than probably there has been for a long time. So again, I think that's something that you should take advantage of. I agree. So I don't, I don't have the, um, the steady answer to that. I think that's a good question, a good hypothesis. Are people more willing to answer the phone for unsolicited phone calls or unscheduled phone calls? Might be a good study. Uh, maybe we have a study together, John. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that's something to get into. 
<laughs> yeah, and I think it'd be. Fa- I think there's so many things happening right now that'd be a fascinating, a fascinating study. Um, but going back to the going back to the trust factor uh, again, as you say, I mean, it's on the consumer side. You know, the trust factor is built through the obviously through the brand and through the product and through the customer service and all of that. And the trust factor, as you say, in B two B, is built often from the human interaction. Do you think that sometimes we pay enough attention or really understand how to build trust and and what what building trust actually looks like? For the for the majority of people I would say no um, because we have our objectives and we focus on our objectives not so much as the uh, the client's objectives or goals. Even mm-hmm. if we know the client's objectives we know their, their objectives for 2023 are going to be A, B, and C but we're still biased based upon what our goals are and what our objectives are going to be in to um, close a deal with this client. Uh, When building trust, it's good to, um, everyone defines trust a little differently, but what we're forgetting is there's perceived trust. And I'll use this example. Mm -hmm. Um, Say, John, I'm I'm going to cook you sushi. You might say something like, well, or you might think this, I don't know Mike's experience with working with raw fish. I might not want to eat that food. Um, but we'll go to a sushi restaurant where the chef is behind the wall. We've never met them. They're a complete stranger, but we'll, we'll eat their food. So um, if, you put that, if you put yourself in the position of likeness with others who are similar to you, likeness with people who trust you, you're more than likely to be trusted. If, um, let me actually share another story. There was a... Um, a fire, a home fire suppression, a home fire safety salesperson in the late 80s. This person went home to home and the objective was to give the homeowners a test. It was designed that you fail the test. Of course, like, oh my God, I know nothing about fire safety. My whole home's gonna mm-hmm. burn down. I'll buy whatever you have. The average conversion rate in this company was, I think around 22%, but this one salesperson was getting around say 40. So significantly higher, but the person followed the script and changed one variable, the person would give the test and say, oh, John, I am. I, I apologize. I left some important items in my vehicle. Do you mind if I run out, get those items, and let myself back in? Oh, John, go for it. Who would you allow to let back into your house without you there? Someone you trust. Mm-hmm. So you're putting yourself in a position of trust, uh, in a likeness of other people that you trust, and you can use it to your advantage. It's called bundling in consumer psychology. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And also, it's probably interesting, too, that um, by doing that, obviously, you got the trust factor, but also they just, the, 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 that salesperson just gave the consumer some a moment to think and to let it sink in what they just been thinking about. And I think that's a thing that, um, particularly in, in, in B2B sales or whatever, that we're so anxious to keep the conversation going, especially if it's, it's virtual, we're so anxious to keep the conversation going, that we sometimes don't give the other person the opportunity to actually ruminate on what we've just said. Well, I, I like what you said about keep the conversation going because time pressure does play a significant role in B2B. Mm-hmm. So keep the conversation going is very different from having the conversation now. If I was mm-hmm. to just meet you, John, I'm trying to sell you something. By the way, I have a zero sales policy at the lab, so we don't have to sell you anything ever. But if I was trying to sell you something, I wouldn't, I wouldn't send you that handwritten note, the email, and the LinkedIn request all in one day. I would space it out. Let me use these touch points to my advantage. You're overwhelmed. So if you're going to see three touch points from me in a matter of an hour, you're going to forget about me by tomorrow. But if I use a traditional drip campaign in B2C, but apply it to B2B and trust building, I'll say, I will send you that email today. I'll send you a handwritten note tomorrow. You get the handwritten note in three days. Then a day after that, I send you a LinkedIn request. Now little drips, little reminders that I'm present. And when it comes to B2B, once that trust is established, you don't have to really sell anything. It's that little reminder that you're present and you're likely to get hired. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's kind of like that you're, you're respectful, but you're also um, keeping top of mind and, and you're creating some kind of familiarity. And that's a, you know, as long as you follow through in your process on your, on your promises, then, you know, familiarity and trust tend to get wrapped up together. Promises are, are significant. Um, when in B2B, it's uh, usually the loss of a promise or disappointment is the reason why we look for an alternative. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and then obviously how you deal with, um, you know, if something does go wrong or something doesn't, isn't followed through with the way it should be, how you deal with that, uh, with that issue as well can play, can play an important part. Because I do, do think today, I mean, we have to be realistic. 
there's very few um, products or services out there that are so differentiated that uh, you know they stand on their own. Most of it, as you said at the beginning, most of them are commoditized and then are differentiated by the customer experience. Absolutely. Uh, the way we engage with the product does make a significant difference. And it's important for the brand to realize that because we might create a product and we think the customer is going to do X with it, but they're really doing Y. So we want to shift our messaging to match what they're engaging with the product or how they're engaging with it. Yeah. No, I was using the example. I was, I was, I was, um, I can't remember when it was, but when I was traveling, I think it was traveling back to Ireland and coming back to LAX, flight was on time. Actually, it was early. Flight was great. Everything was great about the trip. All went smoothly. And then the luggage was delayed coming off, right? And they didn't update us or anything. So everybody kind of got frustrated. And it's funny, like when I was driving home, somebody asked, like, how was your trip? I said, it was terrible. And the reality wasn't terrible. It was terrible at the last piece at the end was terrible, but that was my overwhelming experience. <laughs> and airlines are starting to change message framing as well because we mm -hmm. look at the, uh, the flight schedule and we see delayed. Like, oh, that, yeah. that's, a, that's a negative reaction. And so now a couple of airlines are testing uh, slightly behind schedule or slightly behind. <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll see how that goes. I'm saying they're they're dealing with a very cynical audience out there who've been burned too many times. So we'll see how successful they are with that. <laughs> and you know, the the people might be coming back slightly thinking about changing my airline. <laughs> well, listen, uh, Michael, this has been fantastic. Uh, all of Michael's information being his contributor bio below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and Click Suasion Labs. Yeah, you got it. Appreciate it. So uh, I am a formally trained and educated psychologist. I cannot tell you I have bad parents. I focus on consumer decision making, not our own personal making decision making and experiences. Um, I'm an entrepreneur by torture since I was 13 years old, uh, and for the last seven years, been with Click Suasion Labs, researching how people make decisions and applying psychology to marketing, communication, and employee engagement. Uh, you can get a bunch of research, no cost, absolutely complimentary, clicksuasion.com, C-L-I-C-K-S-U-A-S-I-O-N.com. That's fantastic. Listen, Michael, again, thank you so much. It was a fascinating uh, discussion. My name is John Golden, Says Pop Online, Says Magazine, Pipeline, and CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.